Hi, I'm Richard Bilderbeek. Uh, this is me. I'm a postdoc at Molecular Immunology, part of the GBB, part of the Rijks University of Groningen. This presentation you can find it at this URL. It will also be in the last slide, so you can um, uh, get all my figures. And it also includes some R scripts that I've used to generate the results. So my talk is about this, the overlooked importance of transmembrane helices. Uh, and it's um, an, in, in, the f in the context of molecular immunology. So to kick things off, this is a, a cartoon in the 80s. So in, in French it's called uh, Il était la vie. Uh, and it's about uh, the human body. And this was episode 21, which is about the human immune system. Um, and as a kid, it was just action-packed with all these f f people and uh, things doing adventures. But uh, when you grow up, you learn what those things actually meant. So uh, the white blood cells are apparently B cells and T helper cells. That's biologically unrealistic. Also, there are no genders in uh, white blood cells. Um, also, so this is a bacterium, apparently. Uh, this appeared to be a virus. This was a macrophage. Actually, macrophages more hunt down are more likely to hunt down bacteria. And this figure watching out of a cell is uh, well, a, bit, a bit useless in a biological context. Uh, but uh, this will be about cells presenting themselves. So when a cell gets infected by a virus, a cell needs to show it has been infected. And that's what this talk will be about. So... Um, a cell signals if it's healthy or infected by presenting its epitopes using MHC1, and I will walk you through it. So this is a classical textbook picture. I took this one from a Wikipedia. At the bottom I have some definitions. So an epitope is something that can start an immune response. So the cell presents something that can start an immune response using MHC1. In that way it shows it is healthy or not. And this is the textbook, and in this talk you'll figure out that maybe it's a bit more interesting. So I'll walk you through it. So here we have uh, some protein in the cytosol. Actually, a lot of uh, any protein in the cytosol this applies to. And there's an organelle or um, a protein complex called the proteasome that shreds the protein into pieces. So it randomly shreds random cytosolic proteins to pieces. It's not completely uh, random. Um, but the order of the amino acids will remain the same uh, and the peptides will have different fragments. It's not that all of them are shred to equally likely, but for this talk, let's assume so. These peptide fragments uh, then get transported using TAP, loaded on MHC1 and presented to the outside world. Also, these peptide fragments, um, they will attach to MHC1. Usually they have 8, 9 or 10 amino acids long. Um, because th that fits in best in MHC1, and that's how it's presented to the outside world. In this way, the cell randomly samples, like, sh like shreds its own proteins, shows it to the outside world, and if the immune system recognizes that protein, like, hey, that's my protein, those are my epitopes, those are my peptide fragments, then uh, the cell will, s will, will stay alive. But if a virus infects the cell, then it will make its own viral proteins, and those viral proteins, cytosolic viral proteins, are shreds to pieces as well, presented to the outside world, and then the immune system detects an unknown uh, peptide fragment, an unknown epitope. So it will start an immune, res uh, an immune response and will likely kill the cell. So that's how a cell signals that it's doing great or that it's infected. And notice that everything, the, the proteins and the proteasomes, they are cytosolic. And that's a question. So what about the membrane proteins then? So this is one of my favorite proteins in the human proteome. It's called SMIM11A, small integral membrane protein 11A. Uh, and it resides in the membrane. Uh, it's an alpha helix. So it's somewhere in these membranes. And according to this story, it's, it's, it, the, according to this textbook story, it won't be shred to pieces by the proteasome because it's not in the cytosol where the proteasome is. Well, that is what my 
talk will be about are epitopes that are derived from a transmembrane helix. That means um, are uh, these peptide fragments of, uh, let's say, nine amino acids long from membrane proteins. Are they presented at all? Spoiler, yes. Are they presented just as likely? Spoiler, more than you would expect. And are they evolutionarily conserved? That's the last, last part of this talk. Um, so we'll, figure, we'll find out that this textbook example is a bit of a simplification, uh, but, but that's new. So let's start with this question. Are epitopes derived from transmembrane helices presented by MHC1? So if a, if a, if a protein has a transmembrane helix, it's a membrane protein, um, thus... Uh, according to the textbook, it will never be presented because transmembrane uh, proteins are not shred to pieces. Hence, 0% uh, of the epitopes overlap with the transmembrane helix um, and because there are simply no membrane <coughs> proteins presented. So this is what we would expect by chance if we allow, if, if we assume that the textbook example is true. But once upon a time, which was six years ago, uh, this girl Ingrid Schellens from the University of Utrecht uh, and some colleagues, they looked at what does MHC1 actually present. So that was the molecule that presents the epitopes to the outside world. And what they did, they washed away everything that was presented. They used mass spectronomy uh, to determine the sequences of those epitopes. And here we see, can see a graph, how long those epitopes were, and we see that most of the peptides, uh, most of the epitopes consist out of nine amino acids, which was expected uh, from biological knowledge, because we know that MHC1 is a molecule that um, in which um, a, a peptide from nine amino acids long fits in best. So this was uh, completely expected, uh, but it's great that they did it, because two years later, um, these researchers came up. These are Frans Bianchi, Geert van der Boogaard, and Johannes Texter. And they published an article in 2017 with the question if these epitopes were derived from a predicted transmembrane helix. Like if they, were, if they would come from a membrane protein and especially um, a transmembrane helix from a membrane protein. Because from the textbook you would expect no. But what they found is, yes, they are presented. They say they give this number of 1% of those epitopes uh, comes from transmembrane helices. I'm not going to talk about that because I have a cooler uh, calculation, which I think is even better, uh, and it fits my story better. So I'll, I'll, I'll use my work uh, because I redid that calculation. So what you need to do is I needed to do topology prediction. So this is how topology prediction looks like. Here we have a, a FASTA file in which we have the name of SMIN11A, uh, this protein, and this is its amino acid sequence. And we wanted to predict the topology. So you can do it by hand. You don't need a wedding ring, um, but I needed a hand. So you, you can do it by hand by putting it in a web server and combining this with an Excel sheet to get the, the topology. But you can also use a script, and I've been using an R script, and that's how you can also easily generate and reproducibly generate the topology. That's what I did, actually. This took me a minute to get from there to there using some R code. So what I wondered, uh, what I really did, is I took the epitopes from uh, Ingrid Schellens from Utrecht, um, and I mapped them on the human proteome. So I took uh, the reference human proteome by the Unum Genome Project and for the epitopes that I could uniquely find on the proteome I said all right so here we have a protein these three epitopes are mapping on that um, on this protein what's the topology of that protein well here it, you can see its prediction and you see that this one is um, has is membrane protein the M means membrane O means outside I is inside or cytosolic so this epitope was fully from a membrane protein. This one was partially membrane protein, uh, mem transmembrane helix, 
but also one amino acid came from the inside of the cell, from the cytosolic side. And this epitope was partly uh, transmembrane helix and partly sticking outside of the cell. Uh, of course, this is a nice example, but um, it allows me to, to tell the story um, for, for, for this protein. But if you scale it up, uh, if you take a look at all those epitope sequence, figure out which proteins you can uh, uniquely identify them to, predict the topology, you can just simply count. I found 780 epitopes to be uniquely mapped to the human reference proteome. Out of those 780 epitopes, I find 113 uh, to be overlapping with the transmembrane helix or be completely transmembrane helix. So that means I arrive at 14.5% of all the epitopes that are presented and that are can be uniquely identified stem from a transmembrane helix. And here uh, at this URL, you can download the script and redo my calculation. It takes uh, approximately one hour, this calculation, but then you get the same results. So that means that, uh, so I've showed you uh, my approach, uh, but at least the four of us now agree that yes, indeed, transmembrane helices are presented. And that leaves, um, that makes us question the textbook example. I took it from Wikipedia. Um, that may be a simplification. We've discovered this, um, that, uh, that there may be something else. So um, that means that in the paper in 2017, in which they discovered that peptides, that epitopes were presented using MHC1, that we don't know the cellular mechanism yet. So there are some question marks here. Uh, we simply don't know how those transmembrane helices get presented. And uh, we have Frans Bianchi and Alexina de Witt who exactly work on this cellular mechanism to figure out um, how this happens uh, inside of the cell. So that concludes us that transmembrane helix derived epitopes are presented, yes, and that's new and we don't know how. So that happens, but this is just as likely Spoiler, yes, uh, they are presented even more likely than you would expect by chance. And are they evolutionary conserved? Um, that's the last part of this presentation. So what we've already seen, as I hope we have established this, is that yes, epitopes from transmembrane helices are presented. But is this, is this a very rare event, or is it a very common event, or is it just as you would expect by chance? So that's, um, um, so that's what already the older study looked at uh, and we'll slowly work into their analysis. So first we're going to ask a very naive uh, null hypothesis. It's naive for two reasons which I will explain but it allows me to build up my story. So let's start with our null hypothesis that each epitope is as likely to be presented. So with this hypothesis here we have uh, the protein sequence of SMIM 11a we can make all epitopes of a length of nine amino acids and we can predict if it's as likely to be presented. But it's naive for two reasons and I will immediately show you now is that if we have these epitopes and we determine the IC50 value of it, the values will differ and the values are not very important. What's important about IC50 is that the lower that value is, the likelier that epitope is to be presented. Um, and the likelihood it is to be presented, we also assume that the likelier it is that an immune response starts. Like if it's presented, if it's not presented, no immune response. The more it's presented, the likelier the immune response. Um, but already here we see that different epitopes are, have a different likelihood to be presented. So this epitope has the highest likelihood to be presented. And we could already know that there would be a difference because here we have a structural representation of MHC1 and there's a cleft in it uh, where a, 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 a peptide of nine amino acids can fit in and just not all amino acid sequences uh, fit in just as well uh, because yeah of course there are some constraints there. So this was very naive, that was already naive for the first reason. The second reason is that humans differ in the shape of the MHC1. So uh, humans, um, we have uh, our MHC1 complexes are called HLAs, which is the uh, human leukocyte antigen. It's our peptide, uh, it's our protein 
to to present its MHC1 for humans and we have different haplotypes so a haplotype is an allele but then from a male or a, from your mom or your dad and uh, if you have this haplotype HLA-A11 then this uh, epitope is likeliest to be presented whereas if you have this haplotype then this epitope is likeliest to be presented so we differ in our uh, MHC1 we differ in our, in our HLA molecule uh, and that's actually very beneficial for us as a species because that means if a, if a killer pathogen comes around then some of us are likely to be to, to survive because we are very variable in our um, antigen presentation so these were two reasons why we were very naive um, this null hypothesis is completely rejected that nonsense also on Wikipedia you can read that HLA genes are highly polymorphic and also in the original study by Ingrid Schellens et al from Utrecht what they did they checked for three HLA haplotypes um, which epitopes were presented and they saw that most of the epitopes were uniquely presented and four uh, only four were presented by the three haplotypes they investigated so this null hypothesis is completely naive but it allowed me to tell about epitope prediction so let's refine our hypothesis because here we're talking about um, we are interested in transmembrane helices so our improved null hypothesis that each epitope is as likely to be presented regardless of its origin so here we have four epitopes i put them in different colors like on smint 11a it has different colors so here we have an epitope that's completely um, not in the the membrane protein the yellow one is ex completely in the membrane in the transmembrane helix part here we have uh, an overlap with uh, the inside or outside world and here we have uh, also a non-transmembrane helix part so now null hypothesis is regardless where these epitopes come from on average it's irrelevant um, in their uh, presentation and for that first we'll also uh, refine our definition of epitope because up until now an epitope had an IC50 value in which a, a lower value means it's likelier to be presented but there's quite some competition in epitopes and if these values differ quite a bit it means that in practice um, the, the likeliest to be presented will dominate so now we're going to say an epitope is something that can actually or probably start an immune response um, you can also call it a binder a strong binder so those are the epitopes that really dominate binding to the MHC1 or in humans the HLA-A and we define an epitope now as having the lowest 2% of the IC50 values this is per haplotype because it differs so the 2% of lowest possible values from now on we define that as epitopes we're not going to look at all the others anymore how does that look like so here we do smin 11a we analyze it uh, here it has its epitopes like uh, I, I skipped the beginning I skipped the end but these are some epitopes this is its predicted topology these are the IC50 values just one very low um, and only this one is an epitope whereas the others are not so in this case from in this talk from now on an epitope is a strong binder and actually for uh, the haplotype i've used here hla11 there was only one epitope found on smim 11a and accidentally it overlapped with the transmembrane helix so we're going to plot this now and we're going to then uh, scale up to multiple haplotypes and multiple proteins but first we go back to our hypothesis so we the hypothesis that each epitope is as likely to be presented regardless of its origin so it means these four may or may not be binders but two of them overlap with the transmembrane helix and we expect to find as much strong binders regardless of the topology we can simply count those so this is how uh, the graph will look like but first we go back to um, to our smim 11a so smim 11a has uh, consists out of 15 nimers so here's its sequence again here's its topology where one is transmembrane helix 
and 29 of those nine-mers overlap with the transmembrane helix. That means if topology is irrelevant, approximately 58% of all the nine-mers uh, that are binders um, will, be, will um, come from overlapping with the transmembrane helix. So that's this axis, the percentage of epitopes that overlap with the transmembrane helix. By chance, we expect in 58% of all chances, uh, an epitope will come from a transmembrane helix because 25% is overlapping with the transmembrane helix. But this is a very small protein. We only have one binder, I highlighted in red here, which overlapped with the transmembrane helix. So that means in practice we find 100% of the one of one binders overlap with the transmembrane helix. Thus, for this haplotype, I have one binder which is all 100% all overlapping. So for multiple haplotypes, the figure will be very similar, but you'll see there's, there, there are two new options. So here we have multiple haplotypes now. And this haplotype, for example, does have a binder, but 0% of those one binders overlaps with the transmembrane helix. That means that binder is somewhere else on uh, the protein, probably at the start or at the end. So um, zero of one binders overlap with the transmembrane helix. Here we have two haplotypes that even do not have a binder. Uh, that has to do with our definition of what a binder is. Uh, so those simply don't have any binders. But this is of course very, uh, thi so this is not statistically robust because it's just a one small protein. But you can imagine if we do this on a whole proteome, then we can also have our null prediction and see if, if, if the bars get higher or lower than predicted by chance. So that's what we'll do here. And that already has been done in this paper in 2017. So this is, a, th this is the, the figure they published. So here we have the HLA haplotype, the MHC1, the, the, the haplotype that presenting the epitopes. At this axis, they plot the, the percentage of epitopes that overlapped with the transmembrane helix. The red lines are what you would expect by chance. And you find in most cases that there are more of the epitopes overlapping with the transmembrane helix than expected by chance. So that's new. So already they figured out that yes, it is presented, but not only that, it's also presented more often than you would expect by chance. So up until now, I've been showing mostly old results. But then uh, Geert van der Boogheid and Frans Bianchi, they contacted me and they said, hey Richel, how general is this pattern? For example, does it hold in pathogens as well? So what I did, I redid the analysis, very similar. I did small deviations and I figured out, so I've checked the same thing happening in a virus and a bacterium. Uh, so the virus was SARS-CoV-2. Uh, the virus mycobacterium tuberculosis. Uh, the horizontal line is the, the percentage of epitopes overlapping with the transmembrane helix as expected by chance. And you see in general that, um, that epitopes that come from a transmembrane helix are presented more often than you would expect by chance uh, in humans, in SARS-CoV-2, and in mycobacterium tuberculosis. So it's, a, it's general over... Uh, well, species not good over, over in humans and pathogens. Also, um, um, the human immune system has another uh, part called MHC2. So I've just talked about MHC1, which is mostly used in uh, if a for a cell to say it's infected by a virus. Uh, MHC2 is when it's infected by vi by bacteria. So does the same pattern hold in MHC2 as well? So I'll do a brief talk about MHC2, because in MHC2 what happens is a, a, a bacterium um, is phagocytosed, and then in the cytosol it's those its peptides are shred to pieces by cathepsids. And also they end up in uh, peptide fragments of random lengths, also in the cytosol. And, uh, so it's and then they get loaded on MHC2 and they are presented. Well, MHC2, it's a different uh, presentation protein. It prefers uh, peptide fragments of 15 to 24 amino acids long. Uh, but the process is very similar. It's also 
all everything inside the solid here. But taking a look at doing the same calculation for MHC2, then uh, we have different haplotypes because it's a different molecule we work on. Now we have MHC2 in humans also called HLA DQ, for example. And we find that, again, TM uh, epitopes that overlap with the transmembrane helix are presented more often than you would expect by chance. So again, the horizontal line is what you would expect by chance. And these bars uh, are usually above that line. They are presented more often than you would expect by chance. Also, there are here four spots where there's no bar. That's a fun fact. I'll leave that open for the questions. So it means it's a very general pattern. So to recap, are transmembrane helix-derived epitopes presented? Yes, that's new. We didn't know that. We don't know how that happens. They are presented more often, and it's very general. So if this is such a general pattern, then maybe they are also it's also evolutionarily conserved. Like if it's so general, then maybe evolution has done something with it and used that information for its benefit, that there's some selection pressure uh, for uh, these co th this presentation. And that's the last part of this presentation now. I'll discuss. So the research question is, are transmembrane helices evolutionarily conserved? Because we see they get presented more often than you would expect by chance. So then you could argue, well, maybe they are evolutionarily conserved. Um, because that may uh, help us figure out why they are presented more often than you would expect by chance. So our null hypothesis is that mutations occur equally in proteins regardless of topology. So you have SMIM11A, its name, its sequence, its predicted topology. And we can, so the null hypothesis is that any mutation that happens somewhere in that protein is equally likely to occur regardless of topology. So to figure this one out, we use the NCBI database, dbSNP, DB, yeah, DB SNP, and it has 675 million human SNPs, single, single nucleotide polymorphisms. And that's what we want. We want to see an amino acid going from a new amino acid, from A to a B amino acid. From that big database, and you search for the word membrane protein, you find 1,100 membrane proteins. In each of these membrane proteins, um, you'll find a lot of SNPs, out of which 5% are amino acid substitutions. This is only 5%, uh, because uh, if there's a single nucleotide polymorphism on the DNA level, that doesn't mean this DNA is even red. That doesn't mean that the DNA, um, if it's uh, translated, it may be synonymous mutation, so that has no effect on the protein at all. It may be that the DNA is in an intron, so that means it doesn't reach the protein at all. So, but f uh, it also can be that there's a frame shift or an uh, insertion or a deletion. Uh, but we choose to focus on, because we have plenty of data, to only focus on those 5% of SNPs that are pure one-on-one -on -one amino acid substitutions. So here's how such a, it's called a variation, looks like. Uh, so we have a protein, MPO 2345.2. It's a protein, that's what the P signifies, at which this variation in an alanine at position 295 is um, replaced by a valine. So that's a big data set to, that we could work on. And I'll illustrate this on SMIM11A again. So SMIM11A has 58 residues, um, and 21 of those residues are transmembrane helix. That means approximately 36% is transmembrane helix. And from all the, um, all the SNPs, we found one useful one, which was a um, substitution here at the beginning, in which a methionine gets replaced by a valine. Well, that doesn't mean that most of our SNPs will, at the be will be at the beginning of proteins. Um, we'll find them everywhere in uh, throughout all the proteins. But in this case, it happened to be at the first position. So if you have so much SNPs and we want to figure out if they are conserved, we'll be I'll be showing the results in this figure. 
So at this axis, we have the percentage. So there will be dots on this figure, and each dot will be a protein. Each protein will have a certain percentage of transmembrane helices, and each protein will have a percentage of SNPs in those transmembrane helices. Well, to focus on this axis first, so proteins can have 0% transmembrane helices, those are cytosolic, and more and more and more, and then there are usually membrane proteins. But of course, there are no proteins that are 100% transmembrane helix. That's what this triangle tries to show, that it's, it's, it's less and less likely to move right on this. Um, th there will be more proteins at this side than at this side. So, th and this dashed line is, um, is, the, is if everything happens according to chance. So if a protein has 50% of transmembrane helix, and if mutations occur just as likely within as outside of a transmembrane helix, then we expect 50% of the SNPs to be in the transmembrane helix. So, but I'll, I'll show first some examples. So first we're going to get rid of the cytosolic proteins. So all the cytosolic proteins have 0% transmembrane helix, and thus 0% of all the SNPs will be in the transmembrane helix. That's a very obvious one. But it may be that transmembrane helices are not evolutionarily conserved, uh, but they're evolutionarily neutral. That means that the SNP, single nucleotide polymorphism, is as likely to occur in a transmembrane helix or outside of it. So, for example, if a protein has 25% of transmembrane helices, then you expect 25% of the SNPs to be in transmembrane helices. Um, so, this dashed line is now replaced by the red trend line. It's just simply a linear uh, regression. We expect to find a lot of dots there. That's of some chance effects because we don't have an infinite amount of SNPs per protein. Um, so sometimes, so a lot of points will lie on this line, but sometimes, for example, let's take this point. This point has 50%. This protein is half transmembrane helix, but just by chance, 0% of all SNPs were, were on the transmembrane helix. So sometimes you find that. It can also be the other way around. For example, here we have a protein that has approximately 25% transmembrane helix, but all of the SNPs happened to be in those transmembrane helices or one transmembrane helix. So there's variation because we don't have an infinite, infinite amount of SNPs. So this is how the picture and especially the regression line would look like if transmembrane helices are evolutionarily neutral. So um, if transmembrane helices are evolutionarily conserved, it will look like this. Um, it will look like this because if we have, let's say, a protein of that's 50% transmembrane helix, we expect less mutations there. So we expect less SNPs to be there. So this is how the regression line looks like if transmembrane helices are evolutionarily conserved. The other way around is, let's say, transmembrane helices are a hot spot for mutation, then the trend line will go above the dashed line. So now I'm going to show you the results, and you'll see that the transmembrane helices are evolutionarily conserved. There are, there are actually two trend lines, um, because the red one is a fit that includes the cytosolic protein, so there's a strong pull towards the origin, and where the blue line uh, only uses, uh, uses uh, membrane proteins, but you see that it's very similar. And for the statistics, if you use uh, a binomial Poisson test, then you get this p-value that uh, yeah, they are definitely evolutionarily conserved. Um, you can also put a, we, we, you can also determine how strong is this effect. How what's the relevance of this? Like, sure, it's evolutionarily conserved, but what's the difference? Well, it means that if you find one SNP outside of transmembrane helices, we'll find only O.92. SNPs inside transmembrane helices. So that means a difference of approximately 8%. So that means, are transmembrane helix-derived epitopes presented? Yes, they are presented, and we don't know. That's new, 
We don't know how, but we know it's more often. It's a general pattern, and we know that it's even evolutionarily conserved. So there's something going on here that we just didn't know four years ago. So the conclusion is that transmembrane helices are an overlooked source of epitopes. Because first we expected them never to be presented, but they are. And they are also a source of epitopes in both MHC1 and 2, in humans and pathogens. And they are evolutionarily conserved. So we've been overlooking those um, for quite some time. So there are still some open questions. So the, the cell biology question is like, what is the interest cell in your pathway? So what is going on in the cell that allows it to present membrane proteins and the epitopes that overlap with these transmembrane helices? Um, also, we see this over-presentation of transmembrane helices, but why is that the case? Like, you could argue that transmembrane helices are structurally more conserved. You could argue that, but you could also the other way around, because also uh, the whole protein has constraints on it build, its build-up, like it has to have beta sheets, uh, especially the active site is highly conserved. Um, so, so, but this may be the case, but maybe um, transmembrane helices are over-presented, due to simply an irrelevant feature of MHC molecules. So MHC1 and MHC2 molecules, the, the, the cleft where they present their epitopes is called the hydrophobic cleft. Transmembrane helices are hydrophobic because they are in the membrane, which is hydrophobic. So maybe this overpresentation is just a by effect of that the MHC molecule works, works like that. It it's a hydrophobic cleft. It could also be that the TMHs are more present than you would expect um, because pathogens cannot develop escape mutations. So um, the from human proteins, but also from viral and uh, other pathogens, proteomes, these transmembrane helix epitopes are presented more than expected by chance. I've shown you this. Um, so the immune system is very attentive towards those epitopes. And maybe the immune system has gotten that attentive to those epitopes because due to also the structural constraints of transmembrane helices, pathogens cannot escape, um, cannot develop escape mutations. Like pathogens need transmembrane helices for their proteins, for their membrane proteins by definition. Perhaps they simply cannot uh, escape being detected because they are forced to use transmembrane helices. So which of these three it is, it's unclear. So that leads me to the end of this presentation. So it's an uh, online presentation. So this is my email address. Here you can download the presentation. And if there are questions, which would be the case in a normal presentation, not on a YouTube video, um, you can ask me now. Um, for those looking at YouTube now, I wish you a very good day. Bye.